Tonight, live from Virginia Beach, Virginia, podcasting all things musical from Southeast Virginia. Our sound, our songs, our artists, and our business. Welcome to SivaCast with hosts Tom Farley and Alton Riddick. Let's get talking. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to episode four of SivaCast. We are going to talk about music licensing, the Harry Fox Agency in particular, and sound exchange. We have, as always, Mr. Tom Farley. How are you, Tom? Howdy, everybody. How's everybody doing? So we're going to get down to business. We're going to talk about, well, the music business, the other part of it, the licensing part of it, something we offer at Siva Sound. Uh, there are many companies out there that do this, and this is a big, big revenue stream that needs to, I think, musicians in general need to learn it as they create music. Uh, so Tom knows a lot about this, and he's going to teach us because I don't know hardly anything. I know some of the examples that have happened. I can put two and two together, but I really, really don't know. So do your thing. Well, I, I think the best way to start off is just like with a simple definition. Uh, music licensing is, is a big deal. And if you're really serious about your recording career and putting your music out there, this is something that you really need to dive into. So let's get a definition, textbook definition. It says, in the simplest terms, music licensing is all about creating an agreement, and that agreement would be shared between the musicians, the people who actually have own the music, uh, ideally the original creator, and the one who would be using it. In other words, you, when you're doing music licensing, you are giving or selling somebody permission to use your music. Right. And basically, it, it accounts for uh, you know their permission to access the content, and it protects you from any kind of unauthorized use, like people just throwing your stuff out there and using it and not giving you your fair share of uh, of either the licensing or the royalty from it. So like hearing yourself, not yourself, but hearing your music played in like a soundtrack or uh, elevator music or whatever, that protects you and allows you to get paid. Is that right? Absolutely. I mean, the thing is, is that um, there's lots of ways that people can use your music. Uh, there's mechanical licenses, and then there's there's people uh, that, you know, if they want to actually take your song and record it on an album of theirs. We, we talked about this the last time with uh, Jimi Hendrix and All Along the Watchtower. Uh, you know, he had to pay a license to Bob Dylan, you know, in order to be able to actually record that song on his album. Now, that, now that's the licensing part of it. I mean, you know, when it comes right down to it, um, you know, I had to pay a, a license fee uh, for every single cover song that I ever put on an album. Like uh, we did a version of Landslide. I did a version of American Tune. We had a live version of Fade Away. And, of course, Tanya's classic, Baby, Can I Hold You, from Tracy Chapman. I had to buy music licenses, you know, so I for each one of those particular albums that those things were on uh, in order to be able to be legally, to legally have the right to do that. And that's the way it should be uh, for everybody who's out there who's recording their music and sticking it out in public. You need to know that your that your music, if it's going to be used, needs to be licensed. And that's a very, very big deal. So what are the types of agreements that we have? Well, I mean, first of all, the owner is a person who actually owns the music, who owns the copyright. That person, you know, uh, is is you know, that's the musician, the artist, okay? The publisher can be the artists themselves. I mean, I have my own publishing company, and so I also own my music. So therefore, any kind of licensing or any kind of royalty thing comes directly to me. I get whatever percentages there are. But some people don't want to have to deal with that, so they actually hook up with a publisher and have their music being published by somebody, a person who's co who's connected to ASCAP or BMI or CSAC or, or, or Yosokan or something like that. Basically, you have those two entities, but then you have the agency. The agency itself, okay, I guess you could say they're the watchdog. They make sure that, first of all, that your music is licensed. And second of all, you know, you know, properly by somebody. They actually bought a license to use it. And But second of all, they also monitor this licensing. So every single time that it's played, Every single time that it's it's actually out there on an, on a CD somewhere, you get a chunk of the royalty for that too. So basically, it, it, music licensing protects you by having people get your permission, but it also allows you to get your uh, your royalties for that to happen. 
Now, there, there's a couple ways that that, that, uh, that could actually be achieved. Uh, when somebody records your song or, or you know, uh, like, like Jimi Hendrix did with All on the Watchtower, or somebody uses it or something in, in, in a, in a uh, movie or something along those lines, basically that's a mechanical royalty. And the, in the United States, it's Harry Fox that makes sure that, uh, that, you are, that those things are tracked and that you get your fair share. However, you know, Harry Fox is not in the licensing business. They're in the tracking uh, your license and, and re- your royalty business. Uh, as far as a music licensing thing, you as a, as a publisher, like if you publish your own music, like I do, I have a music licensing agreement. I have the form. Basically, if someone wants to license my music, they can see me, and we could, I, I can send them the form. We can agree on, on, on a cost or a percentage, and we work out that licensing agreement. Now, after it's licensed, then Harry Fox will check, make sure that everything's squared away and check out uh, the actual number of times it's used and be able to get my royalty for that. But the thing is, is that I can also... Yeah, there there are also brokers, so to speak. They're percentage based. Uh, Farley Music Services brokers uh, for some of our artists. In other words, they haven't got the time to actually go out there and push for their tunes to be used or to be licensed by somebody. So I I can I can help do that, and I'll take a small percentage of, of what the license cost would act paid by the user would actually be. But there are big ones like uh, Getty has got a music licensing thing now. Pond Five people have gone to them an awful lot. But they are massive. They have tens of thousands of different clips and different songs that people have submitted to them. You're a very small fish in a very gigantic ocean. Those people will pay you, like Pond 5 will pay you something along the lines of 40 or 50%. Getty won't pay you hardly anything. They pay something like 30%. So at the end of the day, you know, you can actually have somebody go out there and push your music for licensing if you want to. But, but the chances of you actually being, you know, singled out and found, you know, with these gigantic agencies is, is slim and none, unless you actually push, you know, that, you know, that you're on there or something like that and try and get people's attention there. Okay. So, so uh, you know, so basically you, you want to be the owner of your music. If at all possible, you also want to publish your music, your music, and then you could, you know, choose the agencies that you actually want to work with as far as make, making sure that your your music gets out there and that it's monitored correctly. And you're saying the Harry Fox Agency is exclusive to the United States. And I think I heard that when I started researching this. Who are the other ones for like Europe or Asia or whatever? Or do they actually have different companies for each region of the world? They do. Uh, most countries will have their own Harry Fox Agency, so to speak, that will actually you know monitor all of the music uh, and, and I guess you could say performance stuff that, that has a mechanical right attached to it. Harry Fox just happens to be the agency for the United States. I don't know all the names of the other agencies like in Europe, but they're out there. And almost every single country that has any kind of music business status uh, is going to have a Harry Fox agency out there, uh, you know, monitoring and collecting uh, the mechanical rights for their artists. OK, so if you're not attached or signed to a major label who I presume does this for you. Yes, they do. Okay, so you need, as an artist, an independent artist, to do this yourself and and, and, uh, register with these other international companies so they look after you internationally, right? That's right. I mean, yeah, you have, there are, there's some, there's some, you know, it's not heavy lifting, but there is paperwork that you have to do. Basically, uh, when you go with Harry Fox Agency, of course, you, you know, you, you register with them in terms of, you know, creating a profile and all the rest of those things. And once you created a profile with them, you submit it and they'll check everything out, all the, all the linkage and all the addresses and all the rest of those things to make sure that you're squared away. And then they will send you back an email, which gives you a, a password to their site where you can go and register all of your works. Okay. In other words, just because you're hooked up with them, if you don't register your stuff with them, they don't know exactly what they're looking for. So they'll give you a spreadsheet where you, you know you have your your name, your address and date, and all the rest of that kind of stuff. Your publisher, uh, your copyright number, uh, all the rest of those things. And you fill out this spreadsheet, if, especially if you have a, a, a pretty much a laundry list of stuff that's out there. Uh, you know, and, you know, and then you submit it. Once it's submitted, what it, they're actually pretty good. They they will actually have a preview process. So if, if there's any kind of thing on the spreadsheet that is, you know, is not correctly filled out, 
they'll make a highlight to you. So you need to go back and revisit this. And if you have an issue with it, you can contact them and say, hey, what exactly am I supposed to put in this column? So they're actually very, very good to work with. And once that's submitted, then you go into their system, their monitoring system to make sure that everything is squared away as far as your mechanical rights are concerned. Now, the thing is, uh, Harry Fox Agency will will actually do this, but they collect a small royalty. It's not anything that's uh, they're not collecting like fifty percent. They'll they'll take a, a tidbit, you know, something like you know five to eight percent of what they're actually collecting. Uh, since they do it for everybody, needless to say, that adds up to be a lot for the Harry Fox Agency. But you know, so the thing is though, is that they will collect the royalties. They'll pay those royalties to the publisher, and the publisher gets it, of course, to the uh, to the owner. That's his or her job. So the idea of uh, actually hooking up with Harry Fox is is a good thing, especially if there's a chance that somebody is going to take one of your songs and do their own particular version of it, or they want to take your song and use it as part of like a compilation. Somebody around here who wanted to make a, a compilation of works to, I don't know, uh, put on a CD, even though CDs aren't selling all that well. Uh, the bottom line is they would have to license, you know, your music to go on that CD. And Harry Fox would monitor the sale of that CD to make sure that you got your however many cents or uh, per CD sold uh, as part of your royalty. Okay. So you can do someone else's song, but sure, you know, you, that song would be attached to whoever the original writer of the song is. So everyone gets paid that way. Absolutely. I mean, to me, uh, at the end of the day, especially when you get older and performing becomes uh, less, you know, I guess you could say. Uh, practical? Well, practical or even appealing uh, in, in terms of all the work that's involved with doing, with putting on an excellent performance, which you, of course, owe to your audience. Uh, the thing is, is that I always, when I started uh, songwriting, I really didn't, the whole idea of pushing it until somebody actually, until it became a hit you know, going on the road and stuff like that didn't really appeal to me because I had other things like teaching and stuff like that that, you know, I was into as well. So the big deal for me would have been, okay, I got a song, I sell it to somebody. In other words, I don't want to be the name out there. Let them be the name. Let them be in the spotlight. Let them do the concerts. I'll take the royalty, mechanical royalties any day of the week. Imagine it. Imagine if, if you got a, if you had a country tuner and all of a sudden you got it on a Garth Brooks album. Imagine getting like, you know, 9, 10, 12, 14 cents every single time he's, he has uh, that song uh, is, is sold in terms of a download of his album. Uh, imagine how many times it's streamed. You get that, too. I mean, so at the end of the day, uh, you know, having somebody to record your music, you know, it's a, it's a little bit different now with the streaming services. But back in the day when they had CDs and records, it was very easy to track what you were doing. And so that that became like a a way that I would, you know, a thought process that became a, a natural thing for me. But, you know, nowadays with the streaming thing, there there are ways of making sure that you get that money too. Now, sound exchange. Give us the definition of that. Well, um sound exchange picks up uh I guess it takes up the slack of everything else that we haven't covered with our PROs and with the Harry Fox agency. A sound exchange exists to administer what they call statutory licenses for sound recording copyrights, uh, primarily through collection and distribution of royalties for sound recording performances occurring under the jurisdiction of federal law. Now, that's the textbook thing. What it boils down to is that, sure, ASCAP and all the other PROs can do performing rights, live performances, uh, those kinds of things, you know, radio airplay. Okay, that's their that's their gig. Okay, and then Harry Fox has the mechanicals, which basically means if somebody you know gets a license for your song, records it, uses it in the soundtrack, whatever, they make sure that's covered. But what if you know your song's in Pandora? Nobody, you know, Pandora makes up you know all kinds of song lists. You could go or Sirius XM or some cable TV radio station or something like that. Bottom line is, is that. That's the area that's not covered by those other two. Yeah, that's really murky. I was I was looking at YouTube last night again doing research for this, and Pandora, Sirius XM, cable, t- all those things are one thing, and then Spotify, Apple Music, that type of thing. Oh is, yeah, is a whole. They're another, different. It's like it's it's murky at least. 
Well, let's th- th- let's look at it this way, okay? They call the the Pandoras and Sirius XMs of the world non-interactive streaming, which means very simply, if you go to Spotify, you pick out, you put people on your playlist, okay? You select them, okay? Uh, in other words, if if you go um, uh, to to I guess you could say a live performance, that the artists there are actually selecting the music that they're going to play. But however, you know. And non-interactive streaming means that someone did not click to hear a specific song. If you got all of a sudden Pandora is throwing you a playlist, you didn't pick that stuff, right? You know, you might have used okay, Bob Dylan is going to be one of my one of my people in Pandora that I would like to key on, but you're not picking the song that they're playing from Bob Dylan or any of the other artists that you chose on Pandora, and you're not you're not having any kind of selection, you know, power as far as Sirius XM is concerned either. So. That's where um, Sound Exchange comes in. Sound Exchange, basically, if you have songs that are out there, of course, you have to fill out the spreadsheet and all the rest of that kind of stuff, just like you would uh, with Harry Fox. But it's a little bit different. The, the information that you have to fill out as far as your songs and your copyrights and your publisher and all the rest of that kind of stuff, all that's the same. The difference is, is that with Sound Exchange, every single thing about it is free. In other words, they connect, uh, they collect uh, not only national but also international royalties. If you're a member of Sound Exchange, they collect those international royalties for free. So if you're being played in Germany somewhere on some kind of, you know, uh, I don't know, Sirius XM or Pandora or whatever, if you're being played over there and you wouldn't know it but unless you were in Germany listening to them, you know, do their thing, Sound Exchange makes sure that that you get the money that you deserve for having your music. Uh, being used by some kind of uh, non-interactive streaming service. So unlike the Harry Fox agency, where they have counterparts that cover certain parts of the world or the other parts of the world, with Sound Exchange, once you're with them, they cover you internationally. You don't have to go elsewhere for them. That's right. You're absolutely right. Or for you don't have to go elsewhere for another service like it. This is the service for the world. That's right. And see, there are certain things that a lot of people don't understand. Um, For example, uh, let's say that you put your music, uh, CD Baby distributes to to all the different, uh, uh, you know, streaming services that are out there. That's one of the things that they do for people to put their music out there. Well, the thing is, is that every single song that they put out there for every single artist has an IRSC number, which basically is a specific number that is a digital thing that no matter where it's broadcasted, no matter who broadcasts it, that number goes along with it. And those numbers basically are the things that Sound Exchange and, and uh, other agencies will key on to recognize just exactly what is being played. And, and, and how often it's being played and where it's being played. So it's a digital, I guess you could say footprint. It's a digital like, you know, breadcrumb in, in, in a long line of, of different things that might be played on a particular you know, station. But those are the things also that, you know, that they will require to, for you to put on your, uh, your spreadsheet. So basically, you know, they can have that information ready and at hand. And with that, they can... They can do so much in terms of uh, not only tracking, you know, let's say in the United States, but, you know, if that number is actually, uh, you know, if your song is being played and that number comes up in, in, I don't know, in Saudi Arabia, boom, it's there. They, they have a way to track it. Now, are there any other mediums that Sound Exchange would cover? I mean, it just seems, I guess as a consumer, because I have Sirius. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I listen to it or whatever. Everybody does. And we all, well, most of us have Pandora. You know, are there any other services out there? Because it seems like to me, the more I dive in with you concerning this, it seems like there is, there are funds out there for artists that they might not get because they don't know everything and they're not necessarily being told everything. I get that feeling. Oh, I understand. Uh, uh, and that's the, <laughs> that's the, I mean, as far as other services out there, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I have my, you know, I have a su- subscription to uh, uh, basic subscription to Spotify just to track my stuff. I, I'm not on Pandora. I don't do, I don't do serious. I'm so much into, you know, uh, getting my own music squared away as well as the music of other people, the artists on Radio Siva. 
uh, that, you know, I that's pretty much where my focus on music is right now. And, of course, it's been on original and whatever covers we did back in the performing days. But, you know, there are other agencies out there uh, like Pandora. You know, you sign up with them and they'll create playlists for you and or make sure that you get the, the tunes that you want to hear. The thing is, though, is that all of them have a basic set of rules that they have to go by. Uh, as far as what they're actually broadcasting, Radio Siva has uh, basically is put on by Live 365. Well, Live 365 has a legal responsibility. I mentioned this before when we covered PROs, but I'll say it again. They have a legal responsibility every single time a song is played to put that song, okay, and its metadata on a digital log. And so, and that law goes out every week to all the PROs. Now, the thing is, as far as access to whether or not uh, Pandora and Sirius have these kinds of logs, I don't know how they do it, but they are legally required to make sure that 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 music that they are playing is made, I guess you could say, digitally public to the services that are actually there to uh, to monitor and collect royalties for you. And that really answers the last question, which was, you know, why register with SoundExchange? Well, I mean, you know, just like Harry Fox or with ASCAP or anything else, uh, first of all, you know, you never can tell what's going to happen with your music. You really can't. I mean, someone might hear your song and say that, that you know, just in passing, they just happen to dial in, you know, to Radio Siva one day. And all of a sudden they hear a song that says, man, that is exactly what I need for my movie. That's exactly the theme that I'm having for my documentary. Those are the, that's a song that I really want to put on my station, no matter where it is. Maybe if somebody has a, an independent radio station that they, you know, they're on a microphone four or five or six hours a day. If they play your tune, that needs to be squared away in terms of making sure that you get the notice and also possibly get the royalties from it. So no matter what, whether it's mechanical rights or, or the non-interactive streaming rights or performing rights or whatever. It's a revenue stream. It's a way to make money that you basically, it it doesn't take anything more than, than taking the time to actually fill out the paperwork, submit it and making sure that you're squared away. Um, Also as a little aside, Radio Siva does not play cover tunes. Basically Radio Siva will play the original music that was recorded by Oh, the artists in Southeast Virginia, the independent recording arts in Southeast Virginia. That's what we do, yes. The reason why that is so is because even though I have actually got the paperwork in my file cabinet that is the the purchase of the licenses that I needed to record cover tunes, I'm not I would I would bet that a lot of people have recorded cover tunes and did not actually go through the process of purchasing a music license that gives them the right to do that. And at that point, you're in breach, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if they actually record that and put it out there for sale, they're breaking the law. If you haven't got a music license and you do a cover tune on your album and you do not have the permission, okay, which that license gives you to actually record that, you're breaking the law. It's as simple as that. So, at you know, end of the day, you know, that, that was something that came, you know, I did my research with the first time that, you know, we, we did our, our cover tunes, so to speak. Uh, the landslide was, was that, and baby can I hold you were the first ones. And I wanted to make sure that I didn't get, you know, get tapped somewhere down the line saying, guess what, pal, you owe us a gazillion dollars for, you know, even though you didn't make it big, you know, you owe us something for actually using this song. Plus, you know, whatever, you know, criminal reputation liabilities might be in there. So, it's, it's a smart thing to get in touch with. It's a smart thing to do, and it's not that difficult. If you're not used to using a spreadsheet, I guarantee you, uh, basically, you could get with anybody with any kind of uh, business sense at all. If you have all of your your basic stuff there, your copyright numbers and, and, and all the rest of those kinds of things, you can plug in all the stuff that you need. And once that's done, it's done. You know, uh, I, of course, you know, I had to do it in bulk for uh, for Harry Fox and for Sound Exchange, which I did uh, over the last couple of years. But the thing is, is that once the only thing I have to do now is to individually, instead of doing it in bulk with a huge spreadsheet, I can individually register any new releases that I have. 
And that's, that's really pretty easy. I can register it with ASCAP. I can register it with Sound Exchange, and I can register it with Harry Fox because I've already got the connection and I already have my number. They know who I am. Uh, so basically, it's just a matter of logging in, putting in the, the, the information that they require, and then that's it. We're good to go. And that covers all three, the PROs and licensing for two, two different types of mediums. So, yeah, you're covered that way, right? That's exactly right. Every single possibility as far as you and the music that you have created and you put it out there, you publish it for sale, so to speak. Uh, it covers every single aspect of, first of all, making sure that your people have legally purchased it or like a license or whatever. And that also that there are royalties that you could actually earn from having it played on any three of those particular things, whether it's uh, the non-interactive or the mechanical rights or the performing rights, you're covered on all the bases. And you know what? That's, that's, that is great information. I'm glad that you know this, but I'm more glad that we can distribute this for musicians to hear in mass. Uh, too many musicians don't know. Um, and media and music and all of those things it, the our world is changing so so fast and there's so many there's so many gaps and there's so many murky areas there's so much money i feel based on my own research that i i just feel like the artist can easily get duped even passively and if you know your business you get duped a lot less or at all i i implore anybody who has any creator in them that actually created something to understand what the path is for your certain your particular creation for music this is certainly it um for video and things like that i'm sure it's kind of like it but there's other organizations out there that you need to be registered with to get all of your money because these people and, and again i'm not trying to vilify them in general but the Spotify's of the world, the Pandora's of the world, the music business in general is a seedy place. It can be a seedy place. And if there's any way that they don't have to pay you, they won't pay you unless you really understand what's happening. And really, if you think about it this way, it becomes a little more urgent. These people have built multi-billion dollar businesses on the backs of your creation and without you they can't have it but they treat you like you don't matter until you make yourself matter i mean tom was part of a lawsuit to begin you know you know uh with his music and and a, it was a class action thing yeah it was uh called ferric f-e-r-r-i-c-k versus spotify and uh <laughs> I have, of course, I've had my tunes on Spotify ever since it's been out there. It would, you know, CDs were the thing when they first came out, but you know, I recognized that this was this is something that would, you know, eventually grow over time, not knowing that they would be, you know, really sticking it to the artists in terms of how much money they actually provide for them out of the uh, out of the cost that they bring in for for playing their music. Uh, Ferrick versus Spotify is one of many class action and direct lawsuits against Spotify and Tidal and other people to make sure that artists are paid, you know, and, you know, I guess you could say all the, you know, maybe two or three years back, so to speak, uh, all the royalties that they, uh, maybe a, a, a better, shall I say, a more equitable uh, royalty for the playing of their music on the stations. And also it helps uh, in the long run to, as a, uh, I guess you could say a chip in the game to, to make legislation that will actually solidify it, you know, nationwide. That If you're going to play, uh, you, you know, music, created by artists in the United States, you need to give this particular percentage, bar none. And of course, there's used gigantic resistance to, uh, from these agencies as far as, you know, taking money out of their coffers. But it's, to tell you the truth, they're making money off of the sweat and resources that all the artists in the United States have actually put out there to create the music that they have. So Farrick versus Spotify is to the point now where, <laughs> you know, it, it's been going on since 2018. They sent me a postcard they let me know that, that hey, you, you want to be a part of this? I said, yeah, sure. So I went and I looked into it, went online, read their entire thing. And it wasn't until May of last year that the actual suit was finalized. They got the ruling in October and asked for everybody to fill out a spreadsheet for all the songs that they had on Spotify. And you had to go in and research your Spotify number and all the rest of that stuff. But I did all of it, submitted it. And then the other day, which is really kind of cool, 
I got a request from them saying, Mr. Farley, it looks like you're going to be receiving some money. So um, here's your W-9. You need to fill this out and get us back, get this back into the to the, the legal department that's actually doing this uh, the disbursement, so to speak. Uh, so I said, well, who knows? It might be five bucks. You know, it could be anything. But I got about, what was it? About 45 or 50 songs on Spotify. So, you know, and, and I also I know that they've been played a gazillion times because I had them entered in through CD Baby. And you can go to CD Baby and check and see every single time somebody, you know, uh, you know streamed your tune, even though you might have gotten six hundredths of a, of a penny in order to be able for that streaming, you know, which sucks. But at the end of the day, that's that's what it is. Those kinds of things that that information is available to you. So I know I'm being played out there. Certainly not as much as like a a major artist, you know, the Lady Gaga of the world, so to speak. But at the end of the day, you know, I I still deserve my fair share of what little, you know, ripple I happen to make in the ocean, so to speak. So, uh, you know, Ferry versus Spotify is just one step in terms of making things equitable for everybody. So we'll see. I mean, you know, uh, but it is the system at work, so to speak. I mean, that's a wrap, man. I mean, a lot of the things that you said, again, artists need to hear. Uh, This is invaluable information going forward, especially going forward, because like I said, things are changing so, so fast. Well, let me put in one more thing that I've noticed that just kind of popped in my head. I'll have to do more research on it. But for people who are doing live streaming, because, you know, you can't get out and play gigs and stuff. And I'm totally behind the live streaming thing. I think it's a wonderful thing and it'll get better and better as time goes on. But if you're playing a cover tune on your live stream and there, you got a, a PayPal thing and people are paying you for that, I would be I would stick to my originals because you have control over that. You play somebody else's music to get paid for, then someone out there who's in a monitoring agency is going to find a way to make money for that artist. So uh, so at the end, I, I have no idea what how that's going to actually develop over time. But I do know that when you do a, a, a an online go live performance of a cover tune by somebody else and you're getting paid for it. I'm sure ASCAP's going to have something to say about that as they should. I mean, again, this, this goes both ways. Artists shouldn't be stealing from artists. So absolutely. Um, again, changing world, but yeah, it is. Don't become what you hate. Please don't, (laughs) please don't. Absolutely, man. So Tom, this has been fun, man. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been, been a great show. With you. I, I appreciate all of your knowledge. I mean, that's all the time because you're a sage to me. But I mean, with this stuff in particular, for you know the business of music, you are definitely um, just priceless with this stuff, man. So thank you. Well, thank you, buddy. I appreciate it. I, you know, I got my brothers and sisters out there that are uh, doing their thing and trying to trying to be as creative and, and as and as profitable as possible. Anything we can do to help that along, I'm all for it. Well, that's been SivaCast episode four, folks. Um, this is one that you can, you know, push play on over and over again until you understand it. Do your own research. Uh, just make sure you know. Because, again, these people are making a, an incredibly large business on the backs of your blood, sweat, and tears. So just make sure you know your business so you can get your fair share because you earned it. And they can't do it without you. Well, that's been a show. Thank you very much. We'll see you oh, next man, like time. Like I said, it's been great to be with you. Yes, it has been. It ha- Even <laughs> with all this COVID stuff going on, man, it's just good to have uh, uh, continued relationships. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, to be able to do what we need to do using technology to, to still hook up. So, yes. God bless those little Zoomcasters and those little, you know, the mics and all the rest of the good technology that we have at our disposal, brother. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, on behalf of Tom, this is Alton Riddick signing off. But you uh, you guys play your music. Make sure you're doing your business. We'll see you next time. Check out Radio Siva by going to the Siva Sound homepage and clicking Radio Siva or to live365.com and search Radio Siva. If you have any questions, comments, or topic ideas for SivaCast or for Tom and Alton, Go to SivaSound.com and click on the contact tab.